Hi everyone, thanks for taking the time to watch this video. My name is Tim Warden. In this first video in the series on biomechanics of show jumping, I'm going to take you through how the hoof interfaces with the ground to produce forces that will ultimately move the body. And importantly, it is these forces that will affect how the horse can walk, canter, turn, and jump. And the content from this video will inform everything else that follows. To start, I will review some general physics laws followed by describing how the hoof interacts with the surface. Then, I will touch on the stretch shortening cycle, which is an important component of how horses generate force, before talking about constant speed, acceleration, deceleration, and turning. Also, remember that the type of surface and its characteristics will, of course, play a major role in how the hoof interacts with the ground. My hope is that by the end of this video, you will have a better appreciation for how the horse controls forces beneath the hooves to affect movement, and that you begin to consider this with your own horse. So let's get to it. Anytime we discuss physics, motion, and forces, it is important to acknowledge Sir Isaac Newton, the English mathematician and physicist. He had a number of key discoveries that have influenced how we understand sport biomechanics, but he's perhaps most well known as the discoverer of gravity where he watched an apple fall from a tree and was inspired to formulate his theory of gravity. Newton also had three famous laws of motion. The first law states that an object will remain at a constant speed unless an external force is applied. That is, to make change to how the horse is moving, i.e. cantering, jumping, or turning, we need to apply force. The second law states that the amount of force is equal to the mass multiplied by acceleration. Since the horse and rider's mass stay constant on course, the amount of force generated by the horse and rider dictates the acceleration of the body and thus movement. The third law states that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So if the horse's hooves apply force to the ground, the ground will push back with a force of equal magnitude but opposite direction. This is called the ground reaction force. The interaction of forces between the ground and hooves is what allows the horse to propel itself forward around the course. To understand how the hooves supply force to the ground, it is important to define the different phases of stance, i.e. when the hoof is in contact with the ground during motion. The first event that occurs when the hoof contacts the ground is termed the primary impact. This is characterized by the hoof decelerating quickly as it touches down, and at this point it is just the mass of the hoof and limb immediately above it that are generating force. Next, we have the secondary impact. With the hoof now on the surface, the weight of the horse and rider begin to load that leg and hoof, causing the hoof to slide forward on the footing and to accept significantly more mass. The amount of slide is dictated in large part by the footing characteristics. As the weight of the horse and rider load the leg, we get into the support phase, which is characterized by the large forces that are needed to support the body and then propel the body into the next stride. Starting during mid-stance, the hoof will begin to unroll. The next phase shown here is rollover, which begins as soon as the heel leaves the ground and is associated with efficiently propelling the horse forward. Finally, toe-off is simply the event where the hoof leaves the ground, which will lead to the leg swinging through the air before repeating the process during the next stride. Of course, it is important to remember that the stance phase is one continuous movement, and this discrete event shown here simply allow us to break this movement down into its components for closer study. Now, in biomechanics, we break down forces into three directions. The vertical direction, the anterior-posterior or forward-backward direction, and the medial-lateral or side-to-side -side direction. And in any sport, it is critical to understand the general force profiles that occur during movement. In horses, the force profiles are a bit different between the front and hind legs and the leading and trailing legs, but in general, they will follow these characteristic shapes. In all three directions, there is of course no force under the hoof when the hoof is off the ground. But let's examine what happens when the hoof gets into the stance phase. In the vertical direction, when the hoof first touches down, through the secondary impact and up to mid stance, the forces increase rapidly as you can see with the yellow line. This is due to the body weight loading the leg and the hoof. At this point, massive amounts of force are generated, and this force is what stops the body from first collapsing into the ground, as well as what will propel it up into the air so that it can complete the next stride. 
The tendons and muscles work together to accomplish this through what is called the stretch shortening cycle and we will talk about this in a minute. What is critical to appreciate is that the faster the horse is moving, the larger the peak forces will become and the shorter the stance time will be. So as we ask horses to perform at higher and higher levels, the forces their bodies experience become much, much higher and training to prepare the body for these forces is key. Lots of people can train low level horses while avoiding injury, but at the top level of the sport, training needs to be extremely precise to balance the need for training to cause positive adaptation to the bodily structures while ensuring recovery is provided at the right times. Next, the force profile looks quite different when we examine the forward and backward direction. When the hoof first touches down, similar to runners, there will always be some negative forces, which indicate braking. As the body moves forward to propel itself to the next step, the force becomes a positive acceleration force, and this force is what contributes to moving the horse and rider forward. In efficient movement, we want the braking forces to be as small as possible, but try as we might, these negative forces at primary and secondary impact will never fully disappear. If the horse and rider want to accelerate, the positive force needs to be bigger than the negative force in the forward-backward direction for each step. Braking or decelerating is of course the opposite where the negative forces are larger. Lastly, in the lateral or side-to-side -side direction, if traveling in a straight line, these forces are relatively small. But of course, if the horse is turning, then it will lean and push against the ground with its hooves to generate more lateral force so that it can turn. If a horse is going to turn left, it needs to push down and into the ground to the right. So as you can see, the hooves are key to everything. Ultimately, how much and how quickly the hooves can transfer force to the ground, as well as in what directions, will determine the athletic potential of a horse. Also, the farrier is a critical component in the efficient application of forces to the ground. How the horse is set up and the different hoof measurements will influence the angles of P1, P2, P3, which ultimately impacts how the whole leg manages forces. During the canter or gallop, the legs of a horse can be thought of as a pogo stick, where energy is first stored and then released. This occurs through what is called the stretch shortening cycle. When the hooves first touch down, and as they are loaded during stance by the mass of the horse's body, the tendons and muscles will stretch, just like an elastic band. The stretched muscle and tendon will then shorten, producing large amounts of force that are needed to propel the horse's body up and forward for the next stride. Hence the name, the stretch shortening cycle. Since energy is stored as elastic energy in muscle and tendon, it is actually a very efficient method to generate force as less fuel is consumed by the muscle to produce the same amount of force. This is key to how horses can generate large amounts of force at a high speed for long periods of time. Additionally, due to the physiology of the process, the stretch shortening cycle allows the horse to generate way more force than if the tendons and muscles did not stretch before they had contracted. A recurring theme through these videos will be me lobbying for training at speed at home. The reason for this is that the body adapts and learns to move based on what it experiences. So if you only ever canter slowly at home, when you make the jump off and need to open your canter up to go fast, the horse will not have the proper physical tools to manage the increased speed and forces. Obviously, you can't train fast every day, and workouts where you go at a bit faster pace need to be built in intelligently, but without it, all signs point to an increased risk of injury for the horse, as well as poor performance potential in the ring. So let's look at forces in action. First, we can consider the situation where the horse is traveling at a relatively constant speed, as shown here. Once you're at a constant speed, you are looking to minimize the braking forces when the hoof touches the ground. By minimizing these braking forces, you reduce the acceleration needed at the end of the stance, which saves energy on each step and contributes to a smooth gait. To reduce braking, the hooves need to be traveling backward at primary impact or touchdown. It is the same with world-class sprinters. The foot contacts the ground traveling backward relative to the body. This stops the canter or gallop from being jerky due to large braking forces. At a constant speed, the large forces are in the vertical direction. As long as technique is consistent, the faster the horse and rider travel, the larger the vertical forces become. The ability to produce large vertical force, i.e. strength, is ultimately what will determine how fast a horse can travel. 
That is why strength training is so important in any sport with a speed component. If the body is weak, it will collapse when the hooves touch the ground, which will require a large amount of time before a force can be generated to execute the next stride. Conversely, a strong body can stay stiff and tall when contacting the ground and utilize the contact forces to stretch muscle and tendon as part of the stretch shortening cycle. The head also plays an important role in moving efficiently as it will raise up to help generate weak vertical forces with each stride. If you are fighting with the mouth or the horse's head is in a manufactured position, it cannot use its head effectively and the stride will require more energy than from the rest of the body. Lastly, the top horses tend to have pronounced front side mechanics. What I mean by front side mechanics is that when you watch the horse, you get the impression everything happens as the leg swings forward, preparing to strike the ground. Conversely, backside mechanics would describe horses that have their legs trail out behind them a bit more and tend to push down and back on the ground for longer during stance. So in the front end, for example, horses with pronounced front side mechanics tended to have a lot of knee action and the legs look like they are attacking the ground. This allows the horse to generate large forces effectively and to stay in a balanced and athletic position. Next, we can look at acceleration. And the easiest example to examine is a thoroughbred starting, since they are accelerating from a standstill to a high rate of speed in a short amount of time. As you watch this clip, notice that the legs are clearly pushing back down and backward. Pushing down and backward against the ground pushes the horse's body up and forward. On each successive stride, the horse's body will raise higher into the air and the force applied will become much more vertical until the horse reaches a constant speed with no more acceleration. With each successive stride, the angle of force application becomes more upright. This is because physically you can't keep pushing back. It becomes mechanically impossible to be quick and still be pushing backward a lot. So as you get closer to a constant speed, most of the force is generated in the vertical direction. You can also clearly see acceleration in this jump off video. Here, after the combination lands, the horse adopts a clear horizontal driving posture with legs driving back before the regular canter stride resumes. Deceleration, or braking, is essentially the opposite of acceleration. The legs are placed more in front of the body to push down and forward against the ground, which in turn pushes back to slow the body. Here, you can see the hind and front end working to slow the body so the horse has the room and the time to set up and clear the jump. Without slowing the body here, the horse would have inevitably lowered the height. In show jumping, horses are essentially almost always turning to some degree on course. To enable this, the horse will need to modulate forces beneath the hooves in the left and right directions. In order to go left, the horse will have to push down into the ground to the right. Footing is critical for turning, and the horses will have a significant lean throughout the corner, especially at increased speeds. In summary, the hoof surface interaction is the foundation of show jumping. Everything the bodies of horse and rider do in terms of technique all relate back to the forces that are applied to the ground, as this will ultimately dictate movement. Horses generate massive forces with the help of the stretch shortening cycle, such that stored elastic energy is released as the muscles and tendons shorten, propelling the horse into the next stride or at the base of the jump up into the air. Forces under the hooves are altered to turn, accelerate, and decelerate. Think about having these skills when training at home and flatting, or working over poles, and so on. Your horse needs to be able to do all of these things smoothly and efficiently. And when watching and analyzing your horse's movement, consider how force is being directed into the ground. This can be used as a movement screen as well. If you find your horse is hesitant to push into the ground in a certain direction, more likely than not, there is some underlying soreness or discomfort that warrants a look. I hope that was helpful, and see you next time when we examine moving efficiently between the jumps. Please reach out on Instagram or by email with any questions.